where do you see the cultural sphere turning post corona? This is mm. we had a really interesting response to this when we had a conversation, just the two of us. And um, so you mentioned the great consolidation of blue chip artists and the great consolidation of sort of blue chip institutions because a lot of people will go out of contention. Mm. I think, okay, so post-corona, COVID, whatever, what we know is that I think for people who might have chronic health issues or disabilities, we know that it's possible to use digital platforms to make it easier for them to have their artwork and their practice engaged by those who might have similar issues and those who don't. Yeah. Um, we, uh, I, I totally agree. So the adjustments um, that they're choosing to make... Exactly. ...made, because everyone exactly. else has to do it, so they can now make them. So we now know it's possible, because like you say, people who are able body have been able to find ways to use digital platforms to, to work. So now we actually do not have any legitimate excuse to alienate um, people with physical or people with various different forms of disabilities, whether it's physical, health or mental health issues, whatever it might be. So I'm, I'm intrigued to see how we have an increase of people around issues of disability, um, how space. their practices are embedded further. Um, mm. into our cultural kind of discourse and artistic discourse because they are equally a group that is really left out of um, various different cultural and artistic projects, whether that's big and small settings. Um, in terms of the particularities of black bodies, um, I think it's interesting to think about the ways in which we can now perhaps talk to each other and access, access each other on a transnational level, which I think perhaps we're doing to in travel. isolations. Uh, without having to travel, which is a massive without having to travel. Um, but at the same time, it's going back to the fact that some of this is a new ways of thinking and operating. And I always use two like metaphors to think about the way in which black folks across the diaspora whether it's in europe america or the continent of africa and the caribbean have for the last at least 150 years or definitely 100 years have always been in contact with each other we had mm. the pan-african congress here in london in 1901 that was led by the bois um, he had some of the other he had uh, marcus garvey and other leading thinkers that were around and then in 1977, we had the, one of the best moments in history was Festac. That was an international yeah. space of bringing everyone from the African diaspora and the continent of Africa together. Um, so the idea of transnational dialogue and conversations are not new. There's been infrastructures and um, frameworks that exist that we can look to. What I'm interested in is how do we utilize them for our context as um, black people in this particular age of digital platforms and post-corona and with the ongoing issues of um, inequity regarding access to resources on all levels. That to me, that is the real work and interesting work. And then at the same time, how do we have this, how, like I'm over, I hate takeovers, like fuck takeovers, that's dumb as fuck, I'm sorry. Mm. Like, okay, you take over the Tate or the VNA or wherever for an evening and then what? Then what happens next? What's like it makes it easier for them to discount for any other meaningful takeover. Exactly. And also it's just a big strategy for them to hit all of their stats in one night. All of the groups that they don't one, ever get to access and engage with. Night. And then they report to the DCMS and the Arts Council and that's them done for the year. So I want us to scrap these neoliberal models of working and to think much more critically and resistantly to create a infrastructure and a, a, our own kind of ecology of thinking and working um, within the institutions, but also without the institutions. So yeah. having a dynamism of both. Let, um, let's face it, institutions yeah. can be very, I think I'm really enjoying these thoughts because institutions can do, can do two things. They can even metastasize, so they eat you up. Mm. They eat up your emotional labor because you expect something from them when you go mm. in. And, you, and whilst you're in there, nothing changes. Precisely. 
the bureaucracy which they hide behind is usually government. So we're a government body. Well, you're only 30% funded by the government. Where, was, where does the rest of your money come from? And this is the real, the real tea and the real conversation is about how can you, like, um, this is not sexy work, you know, it's not cool work. You can't commodify the kind of stuff that I'm interested in doing, which is about um, accountability and equity, which is always, if you are funded the, by the government, like, even if it is 30%, you have to fulfill certain criteria and objectives. And if they're not doing it, then we need to be reporting them to the funders. We need to be saying, this person, this institution is not meeting your bare minimum. Take back the money. You know, like we need to really hit them where it hurts because until we have a different way of operating, neoliberalism is always going to rule the day. Capitalism is always going to rule the day. Um, so I think that's one strategy. And then the other strategy is actually, if you are going into those spaces and you're being invited as artists, you can make demands. You can say, but I don't know the person of they, colour. They don't know, they don't, some people feel too, let, let's put the real tea on the table. Some people, when they're being invited to the place, are so excited to be invited, that they forget they have agency, mm. which, which perpetuates a whole cycle of oppression. I know. Like and it, it's hella boring, because um, how do you say to someone that actually you do have agency, Yes, you are bringing your body, your space, your practice, your work, whatever it might be, into this space that is culturally white. Um, but you can call the shots. You can make demands. You can expect and ask for better service and better treatment. These are, in fact, white artists do this all the time because I've seen it. I've actually had to work with it. Riders, riders, having riders. People... These aren't are actually unusual... Um, Things to put on, yeah, they're not unusual requests at all. Maybe because you know, if you are an artist in the Tate or the VA or whatever institution is saying, Hey, we now acknowledge and recognize you, that's seen as like a huge compliment, but low key, high key really isn't. Um, because it means if they're telling you, it, it, and it's also okay, it's the artists, but the other two is the curators and other. Um, Mazine workers who also don't mm. advocate in the same way. So one part is the artists and the other part is people like me who do... Internal who, struggles. Yeah, who are situated uh, in these spaces. Who don't also speak up. And those people are just as problematic because actually you're also reinforcing the same structures of oppression that um, um, impacts people who look like you. You're just as bad if you're not supporting and advocating and working with those artists to provide them better experiences you're, you're just as culpable if you ask me mm. um and so that's also the flip side is that there are curators who aren't being daring and being provocative or which is their which is their job description you're meant to question exactly canon. you're meant to have a socratic interaction with it if you just take it as read your practice becomes redundant and then you have to continuously face questioning that is uncomfortable because you're making mm. yourself. Precisely. And I think part of the other, I think there's lots of different elements of um, when you are walking to a context of the canon and art history, um, that can feel like a very intimidating space in terms of this kind of presumed historical legacy and weight that comes with it but then um again it goes back to the fact that a lot of people are generally not aware of the foundations of modern art history and so just to go back I, I was meant to say it and then our conversation went into a different direction but i just want to like yeah. come back into it that i was making a point about modern art history um being predicated on the theft what well, we both were actually of um, non-white people or black and brown indigenous people. But then part of the reason why that theft happened was that <laughs> it's the ironies, right? These same artists at the turn of the 1900s were dissatisfied with what we now call the genres of art. So the genres of art is kind of like how we look at um, art history from like, say the Renaissance period up into the pre raphaelites mm -hmm. And that's kind of like the way in which we determine the subject matter of what's good art is. So it's always it going to be religious, iconography. Of the, um, uh, it was rebellion against, against the canon, against yes. the enlightenment idea of continuous progression. Exactly. So 
um, the hierarchy is like in the hierarchy of art, you have religious iconography, like that's the top. Then you have like human life. Then you have um, animal life. Then you have um, like still objects, so like a lamp or a vase or something. And that's like the hierarchy, hierarchy of genres. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I can't think of what where, where do black nerds There's always lamps. There's always like, like, it's always like it's a like random that. lamp. Like it's always dumb <laughs> shit like this. Um, so these artists like were um, rejecting and rebelling against that in terms of wanting to create work in their own way. So they come into contact with artifacts from Africa and um, Asia and other parts of the world. They're like, oh my God, this is amazing. These people are so in touch with like their uncivilized nature. They're so, on the, they're not conditioned by the modern strife of European life. They're not part of industrialization. They're so in touch with like their animal nature, Un-alien. their innocence. It's a, it's, a, it's a basic Marxist argument that they're making without being Marxist with a, with a big M. Um, yes. They're alienated from their labor, hence why they needed to go find some other way of unalienating themselves by Precisely. also incarcerating other peoples and yeah. subjugating them to the same alienation by imperialism and colonialism. It, and, that's, and that's the tea, and that's the tea, because they think they're being really progressive. They think they're being um, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist also, because there's also this weird element that they think by appropriating the works of um, the colonized person, they are trying to highlight to themselves, the colonizer, that these people have art and creativity and therefore can possess the sublime, the beauty. It, it's mm-hmm. a, the whole situation, it's a mess. It's, it's the kind it of really is it's because it's, it's that whole mess. Movement. It's the whole pinter um, movement. It's the whole pinter movement. Yes. I'm gonna let you go in a second. It's a whole pincer movement that happens continuously where <laughs> in order for, for certain people to advance, they take from others and then they forget that they're taking from someone else or they don't forget. It's implicit in the whole act oh, no, of they, taking. It's implicit, yeah. yeah. yeah, It's implicit in the whole act so, of taking. And they and create that, and that's more than personality and that's where psychosis comes in. That's where um, cognitive dissonance comes in. That's where mm-hmm. all of that tea comes in. Janine, we're going to have to have another conversation about this at another time. Um, go off and impart the knowledge. <laughs> and, you know, be our, be our modern version of um, Saint Paul and <laughs> wrestle, wrestle those, those, those dragons and <laughs> break away from the screen in a, in a more invigorated nature to go and speak about Paul Gilroy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank you very much Eduardo. And yes, I'd be love to come back again and speak about the stuff that we didn't did get to speak about, but I really enjoyed it. I feel, it was quite generative, so an hour is not enough. We're both It's not, to, unfortunately. But we have to we have to put some sort of time on it. <laughs> <laughs> um thank you to everyone who came as well and who left comments and yeah, if you want to ask me any more questions, just drop me a message on my, in my slide, in my DMs, always talking to folks. So, yeah. Anyway, have a good evening, good afternoon, and speak to you soon. Bye, Janine. Okay, bye, bye-bye. So, guys, that was the first in conversation. As you may tell, I have no filter, or I have a filter, and I use it to my advantage. Uh, We have a whole series of conversations coming up for the next two weeks. So I forgot to actually ask Janine to nominate someone because it's a conversation chain. Thank you. I've been Eduardo's Aesthetic. I hope you've enjoyed your time. And see you tomorrow with Burma Eduzi, who will be talking about photography and its effects on him in terms of practice and whatever else comes to our mind. Thank you very much.